Okay, continuing installing one of the SunSync inverters. You've now mounted it on the wall, it's in a nice safe place. You've got your trunking in place. You've separated trunking for your AC side and your DC side, you don't mix them unless you're using double insulated cable, but you normally keep it nice and separate. You've got the various components on there. So you, 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 you're looking to wire your battery. So your batteries connect onto your battery terminals. There's, depending on the model, the smaller cabinets have a slightly different connection to the larger cabinets make sure you've got protection devices on your battery um, we're often using something like uh, just turn the camera a little bit here so here is a protection device and in fact there's one here so here is a uh, protection device there's lots of different protection devices um, and we're just looking as simple with a fuse and an isolation switch I would always recommend to use one and to make sure you use a fully approved one. Don't use something that's a bit Mickey Mouse and you want good, solid, nice thick cables. Cable sizes. Um, generally, most of these commercial batteries come with, um, I can show you, um, this type of cable. Um, these are 25 millimeter. Um, you can't take too much power through a 25 millimeter um, because if you're looking at the bigger inverter, the 8.8, um, that can actually pull 165 amps, 170 amps on the charge circuit. You, that 25 mil cable is too light. At that current, you'd need a 50 mil cable. And so therefore you need to consider the C rating of the battery. So if you're wiring the battery separately onto the buzz bar, just be careful on the cable rating. So a 25 millimeter cable is fine for 50 amps. Um, but once your current starts going higher, watch your cable connections and you have to look at how you wire it. And if you've got a common buzz bar, so you take the wire separately to the buzz bar and then take from the buzz bar to the inverter and via your protection devices. So just be, just be careful on cable sizes and again, most electrical engineers would know that anyway, and they can do their own calculations. So simply for connecting your battery, connecting a lithium battery. A lithium battery is a little bit different because a lithium battery requires communication. And we have what they have communication cable here. Depending on the type of battery, depends whether it's a 485 or it's a CAN bus or whatever, you need to look at the instruction manual. We've covered some in our manual, in our which is common ones, and I'll go through the programming, but depends, but you have to connect one of these, and these are connected to the battery. So if I show you here, you can see on the batteries, they're connected to the batteries. So here is the, the, the DC side, and here is the communication, and the communication goes back to the inverter. And it's the communication comes from the BMS, the battery management system, the BMS device. The BMS device is actually in the battery, and the ba that controls the charge. But the BMS is actually controlled from the inverter. So part of the BMS, the, the inverter talks to the BMS and says, hey, it needs more charge. And the BMS says, well, our battery is 80% charged. So they can work together and it will, it's for safety. And when it reaches fully charged, the BMS will tell the inverter, please stop charging us. And it will send data. Um, a lot of the data is to do with the SOC. SOC stands for state of charge. State of charge is actually a very difficult thing to calculate from just a battery connection because the wires, when you're charging a battery, the voltage goes up. When you're discharging, it comes down. You've got a voltage differential. And when you're looking, say, for example, on lead acid, it's, it's so difficult to, to actually get an accurate SOC because the two voltage is up and down. But on a lithium battery, the BMS takes this into account and it will do some of the calculations. So make sure cables are nice and tight. Use your calibrated um, torque, screw, torque wrench in accordance to the manufacturer's instructions of the protection gear, etc. So make sure it's tight. Don't over tight it, but make sure you, you, your connections are tight because loose connections can cause fires. Um, make sure you've got your communications in progress. And then once you've done that, a very simple thing, if you go to the screen marked, and in fact, I can show you here. Um, I'm going to have to, ah, I'm going to have to switch this in, I'm sorry, I thought it was on. So let me just, let me turn it on. In fact, I was turning it on from here. This is the battery isolation. I'm putting my AC on and I, I can check to make sure that, um, I've got 
the battery's on. Uh, everything is switched on now. And so I can just show you very quickly once the inverter boots up uh, and you can see, um, you can, you can see the, the screen, which I'm referring to, which is actually the lithium battery connection. And it will show you the data that the, the unit is actually communicating correctly. So we're on now and you can see this is the home screen. So we've gone to settings and here, and you see here, and here says volt, battery voltage. In fact, it hasn't actually booted up yet, but you'll get this screen. And in fact, there it goes, it's up now. So it's showing the battery's 52 volts. There's no charge current. The temperature, SOC, state of charge, 62%. And it gives you all this information. So now this will cor correlate with the home screen. So as long as I've got that communication going on, I know the battery's communicating. If I haven't got that information, the battery is not communicating. The downside, if it doesn't communicate, is the state of charge will be incorrect. It might show 100% SOC or no percent SOC. It'll be completely random. Uh, the machine's guessing it, and it's guessing it based on an AGM, uh, which is a type of lead acid. Um, and VLR valve regulated um, gas battery and um, those type of batteries um, are the older batteries and many of you guys may use those type of batteries it's not a problem um, they're much cheaper than lithium and they're, they're very tough and robust I actually quite like them personally but nowadays everybody wants lithium so we'll focus on lithium at the moment so please make sure you are communicating at that point if your battery is not talking to your inverter and you've not got the correct data, then seek advice because there's no point in going any further because this part will come and bite you and cause you a problem. So please, early on, early days, connect your battery, check it on, and then switch off, isolate it, make sure. Just, just, just check your battery is working and then switch off, disconnect, and then you can continue with the rest of the installation. For goodness sake, don't leave your battery connected and switched on while you're carrying the electric rest of the installation because you're gonna electrocute yourself. Um, so please make sure, and in fact, that's just booting up there. I'm going to switch it off in a second and, and the lamp that's coming on there is actually a load so it's just actually emulating the load going out so continuing with the installation um, on page 15 is a sort of general overview but we're looking where we're looking to connect the AC and the solar panels so there's a general overview on page 15 so I'm not richly going through the instruction manual I'm just trying to explain things and how, how things do the connections the input the load the generator auxiliary and the AC are slightly different on the two different units, so be aware of that. Um, talking about on the installation, you know, you have to think about this is on the inverter, think of it as an on grid or grid tied inverter. So your AC connection is both an input and an output, it is both, this is a bi directional. You'll see an, a grid input and you'll see a load input. Do not think the grid is the input and the load is the output. It's not, it's absolutely not. The grid is an input, the grid is an output. The load is a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. So your grid is input, your grid is output, your load is UPS. Please think of that. And I've tried to explain that a little bit on page 15 of the manual. That is very, very important. Now, saying that, because the grid connection is an input and an output, so imagine this is your, 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 your AC. This is my meter. This is my inverter. So this is, this is my, my AC connection. So, okay, if this, connect, if this AC, the power can flow back out, but it will flow back into the grid. Well, it doesn't because we put this on. We put this, this piece of magic, which is what we call a CT coil. The CT coil here blocks, blocks the power going back. So in fact, what happens is you take off here is for your non-essential loads. So your non-essential loads connect to the grid side of the connection. Your load side is your essential loads. Don't go and put every single bit of your load on the load and your grid as the input. It's crazy because especially you've got big air conditioners, it will just trip it. It'll be tripping all the time and you use all your batteries and everything else. If you get power outage, you will lose, you will lose 
like any type of on-grid inverter, you will lose the grid side. It will switch off because the anti-islanding, it's gone, it's gone. And you will just be connected to your load side. So just be aware, your load is your light, your essential load, your security devices, and maybe your, your router and your computer, and your maybe one or two sockets that you need, maybe just to make a cup of tea or whatever. But you limit your load power. That is your load power, you try to limit it but your grid power is your non-essential. So most of your house will be running, your water heaters and stuff will be running, and your, most of your air conditioning will be connected to grid side. The CT coil blocks it, so you're, you're gonna enjoy the solar. You won't be using much power. The CT coil will actually block it. So that's very, very important. One other thing that we talk about general installation, but I'll cover it in a later manual, is to do with the use of residual current devices, RCDs, ELCBs whatever you want to call them. Uh, when I was at college, we called it an ELCB. Nowadays, people call it RCDs. And you know, I learned there was one type of uh, ELCB and it was done on a Wheatstone bridge and it was causing an imbalance and it would trip the circuit. Nowadays, you've got type A, type B, profiling, all sorts of different trip currents. Generally, 30 milliamp is the most popular type and um, you obviously need to refer to the manual, but I'll talk about RCDs. I don't know because different regulations and different jurisdictions have varying regulations. I can only quote to you, for example, for the UK and in Australia, the device has to be detected both input and output. So if you're connected to the grid, you have to have a protection device on the RCD. I can't comment on other countries, and I, so it, it, may be, it may vary, um, but the, basically for safety device, if you're connected to the grid, you need to have an RCD. On the output, you also have an RCD. But because the inverter is um, basically in isolated mains, it won't trip an RCD because you've got two units at the same potential. To get an RCD to trip, you have to basically cause an imbalance. And if you touch one of the two terminals, you're not gonna get an electric shock because there's no circuit to complete because there's nothing to ground. Um, the only, and if you touch both of them, you're gonna get an electric shock. Um, because you've completed the circuit, but it won't trip an RCD. So what most people do, and what a lot of the regulations do, is they say you have to bond the neutral to earth. And by bonding the neutral to earth, would then allow on the live connection to trip an RCD, which it will. However, one thing to bear in mind, when, because this is a hybrid inverter, it's not like any other inverter and you've got no changeover switches and stuff that's completely isolated because this can go automatically connect to the grid. So when it connects to the grid, if you have a neutral earth bond, it may trip an RCD upstream. And by doing this, we use um, our relay that we're using for the generator and we can select it on the, ba on the battery setup and there's, a, there's an instruction covered and you can use a relay which will actually bond the neutral to earth. Now that bond, you might actually have grid presence, but the inverter may be running in islanding mode depending on the setting. So depending on the various settings, it may be run on that. So just have to bear in mind, it's a very useful, don't just use a detector of grid and no grid because it won't work. So this is one issue to be in mind. Um, one thing about, I'm jumping a little bit, but one thing about using a CT coil. When you put a CT coil, make sure you've got it the right way around. There are, there is a video on the website that explains about using a CT coil. But if you go onto this page here, and there's a, there's, if you see here, um, where the CT wattage is on page 17, and you look at the screen, so just by touching one of the dials, you'll get to the screen then if the CT is a negative, um, then when you're actually commissioning the system, you've got the CT coil in backwards. So something to bear in mind. Fitting the solar panels. Now, this is always the issue and lots of people have issues about fitting solar panels and understanding how it works. Well, simple. The unit, if we're gonna focus on one of the units, we're on a, say a 10 kilowatt MPPT, five kilowatt per MPPT. That means each MPPT can handle five kilowatts. Most important thing about solar array is the voltage, VOC, voltage open circuit. You can't exceed 480 volts. Keep it lower, but your voltage can't exceed it because you'll blow the thing to pieces. Your current availability doesn't matter. So 
if I give you an example, if you look at the grid, the grid might be a gazillion amps. Yeah, you, you can't pull it because the fuse is whatever, but the whole grid is massive, massive, massive. But you might be only operating a light bulb that rows one amp because you pull what you need, you pull the circuit. So if you, on your MPPTs, you can put two strings on one MPPT on the bigger inverters. On the smaller inverters, you put one string per MPPT. The power should be balanced. You should balance across the two MPPTs. Um, it's better to balance because of shadowing. Um, and you understand if you've got shadowing on one MPPT, it won't affect the other. But if you've got shadowing, if you've got both circuits, two, two strings, and you've got shadowing on a string, it will affect it. If you've got two strings in parallel, shadowing won't necessarily affect, on one of the strings won't necessarily affect the other string, even though they're in parallel on the MPPT, it will just, you will lose the power of the string that's got shadowing. So just remember that. Calculating your power. If you put, if you chose to put, because many people say, well, hold on, I've got 480 volts mm, and um, I've got 20 amps. Well, let's say 10 kilowatt per MPPT, but it's only rated at 10 kilowatt totally, not 20 kilowatt roughly. Yes, that's true. You could put 20 kilowatt of solar panel on, but you waste it because for the if current needs a circuit, you've got to pull. It's a complete circuit. Voltage is your pressure, your current is, is your circuit, circuit current. And of course, wattage is your current times your voltage. So therefore, if you put, for argument's sake, 10 kilowatts of solar panels per MPPT, as long as you keep your voltage at 480 volts below, it will work but it won't be very efficient. You're not gonna have the benefit of using all of those other than may, maybe the day will last longer. So you can do that. You, you, you'll have a longer production day. Um, you're not gonna get the, the, the efficiencies out of it. You're gonna lose efficiencies, but it will work for sure, it'll work. Because you need to complete the circuit. If your voltage, your VOC exceeds 480 volts, then the unit will trip and you'll get an error. And if you're too high a voltage, you'll blow the inverter to pieces. So please, please focus on voltage, 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 voltage is important. Also, if your voltage is too low, you won't get the startup. So you want to get, a vo and also you look at your cable runs and everything, it's gonna get voltage losses. So ideally, you should be aiming about 350 volts, something like that is a good voltage VOC. Voltage open circuit, not voltage connected, it's your open circuit voltage. So this is very important. So, okay, this is the basic installation. So I'll talk about the programming now.